afternoon. I'd like to ask you a question. Why do we get sick? Think about it for a moment, and I don't mean the causes that make us sick, but why are we susceptible to being sick? My students ask me this in a course that I teach in evolutionary medicine every year, and a question comes up because after millions and millions of years of evolution and thousands and thousands of years of human evolution, why are we still susceptible to things that make us sick? Well, the first thing we have to understand is evolution. Evolution acts in a very specific way. In any organism, there are a number of there are a number that are born. Some of those that are born don't survive to be adults. For those who are adults, only part of them have offspring, so show fertility. So, natural selection basically acts on fertility. Evolution is a natural phenomenon. It just happens naturally. People just either do or do not survive, either do or do not have offspring. The same with other animals also. So evolution is directed towards fertility. Natural selection acts on fertility. Therefore, the push for health, longevity, strong bodies is all through natural selection. But natural selection, not for health, and, and that, but health, a strong body, to the degree it supports fertility. If it doesn't support fertility, then those things are wasted energy, speaking of natural selection evolution, to have us live for a longer time than we do would take away from the, uh, the energy that we could put into our offspring, that we can make new offspring. So basically what I'm going to talk about is this intersection of why do we get sick from an evolutionary medicine perspective. And the first thing I'd like to talk to you about is how evolution still works today and amongst us. You see here the Red Queen. And if you remember from Alice in Wonderland, what did the Red Queen say to Alice when she asked her, why are you running so fast? Because I'm running as fast as possible just to stay in the same place. Evolution is much like that. Evolution is like that treadmill that you see the Red Queen sitting on there, or standing on, I'm sorry, running on, actually. She's running as fast as she can. The same way with organisms. We're evolving as fast as we can just to stay as adapted as we are, to just remain as fertile as we are. So anything that interferes with that fertility would be not selected against. And therefore, things like health, longevity, are byproducts of natural selection, not the end point of natural selection, which is actually fertility. So speaking of the Red Queen here, running as fast as she can, there's other examples of this treadmill evolution that we're running as fast as we can, and I'd like to give you one of those examples. And my favorite example actually is bunnies and foxes. You all know what bunnies and foxes are. Bunnies run as fast as they can to escape foxes, and thereby reproduce new bunnies. Foxes run as fast as they can so that they can catch bunnies and then thereby reproduce themselves and have offspring. So if you look at this diagram, an evolutionary arms race is occurring between bunnies and foxes. Those bunnies there, you see the red fox chasing the bunnies. Well, the red fox is going to catch the red bunny, but he's not going to catch the gray bunny. Rather, she's going to get away and have more offspring. Whereas the red bunny, which is slower, is being selected against by a predator. On the other hand, look to the left of the red fox. You see the two gray foxes that are not keeping up with the faster fox. They are not going to get the bunny. They may be selected against because they're too slow. So bunnies and foxes are in an arms race. One gets faster, the other one has to get faster to catch it. The fox keeps catching the slowest bunny, and therefore the faster bunnies reproduce. That is natural selection. It's that simple. Who reproduces is the one. Evolution basically is a process. And evolution is the underlying guide in bio biology, basis of biology, the basis of physiology, and the basis of life sciences. Therefore, it's also a major base point for medicine. Evolutionary medicine looks at what we see out there and asks a different question than what medicine asks. 
Medicine asks, this, what is wrong with this person? They have an illness. They have a disease. They have an injury. How do we repair that? Evolutionary medicine asks, why are we susceptible to those bacteria and viruses? viruses? Why do we get injuries? Why do these things happen to us? Why do we have these conditions? There's a very different framework there. So evolutionary medicine supports medicine in understanding the evolutionary basis or the whys of disease, and the medicine is looking at the hows of disease. And if you look at this diagram here that I have up, you can see that the root of everything is the same DNA. We share DNA with all the other animals on our planet. And if you look back far enough, we actually would share DNA with things that are single cell organisms and, and, and trees, plants, and everything. So that tree of life that you've often seen there, this one happens to be primates because I'm an anthropologist and I work with primates, but it's the same thing. There's, there's all, th this is all connected. So I'm gonna use an example here of the difference between evolutionary medicine and medicine. Many of you may remember Madeline. Madeline is a cartoon character made up for a children's book. Many of you probably read that particular children's book. Well, Madeline, during one of the early books, had an appendicitis, and she had surgery for appendicitis, and therefore she recovered. However, appendicitis has been a scourge on humankind for as long as we can remember historically. But only in the past 200 years have we been able to perform surgeries to relieve people of appendicitis and help them survive. So medicine has seen this appendicitis, or the appendix itself, as a vestigial organ an organ from our evolutionary past with no more purpose today. So and when we remove it from people, they live a normal life. So it must not be that much use. Evolutionary medicine has a different viewpoint. Wait a minute. This appendix has been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Over 30 other mammals have an appendix. It cannot be a useless organ. It must be doing something. Well, the new model through evolutionary medicine is that the appendix, appendix is actually a storehouse. It's a storehouse for good bacteria, good gut bacteria, as you can see in the diagram up there, or our microbiota, and it's useful for repopulating your digestive system with good bacteria after you've purged your system due to having ingested something like a, 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 a virus or a poison or some tainted meat or too much alcohol. Many people can relate to that, okay? So good gut, gut bacteria is washed out with everything else, but in that appendix is a storehouse, a reservoir of your good gut bacteria, which can repopulate your gut. And you need that bi microbiota because it's what helps you digest your food. It supports your immune system. We have 10 times as many microbes in us, microbiota, as we do human cells. That's how important your microbiota is. So now with evolutionary medicine, we can take and make a new model for looking at appendicitis and the appendix as a beneficial organ. I'd like to give you a couple other examples. So basically, you vomit and you have diarrhea to get rid of that um, toxin that's in your, in your gut. So after you do that, it repopulates your gut. That is a beneficial response. Yes, it's inexpensive also. You lose a meal, you lose two meals, whatever, but it's better than being sick for a long time or dying from a toxin. So therefore, this is a trade-off, a trade-off between health and diet right now. And right now, your health wins in that one. I'm gonna talk about a couple more here, a couple more examples of this. You've all had an infection. You've all had a bacterial infection at some time in your life. I know I have. So when a bacterial infection attacks you, what do you do? you have a fever. The fever is also a highly evolved adaptive response to pass, uh, the bacteria in your system. It raises your temperature so the bacteria have a more difficult time reproducing. Not only do they have a di more difficult time reproducing, they also die. Not all of them, they're also evolving too. So the bacteria are evolving along with us. We are in an arms race with them also. So, you have the bacteria, you get, rid, you get rid of those bacteria, and that's an evolutionary response. But there's another response that most people don't know. Also, when you have a bacterial infection, your blood, your circulating blood, appears to lose iron. Your blood becomes almost anemic. And physicians were puzzled by that early on, and they thought, oh, well, that's a problem. Turns out, when you reduce that blood, what's actually happening is your liver 
is sequestering blood to prevent the bacteria from getting as much iron, because bacteria need iron to reproduce. If your liver sequesters it, they're less likely to reproduce. Again, a highly evolved adaptive response. I'd like to bring up another one here that we've also all experienced, but it's not a physiological one per se, but it's more of a cognitive one. Anybody ever feel fear? Fear. Fear is a highly evolved response. It's a highly evolved emotional, physiological response. You all know the concept of fight or flight, right? It's one of those things we all have heard, and we all do it. We all have fight or flight at different times. That is a highly evolved and probably a very accurate evolved response to danger. For example, humans often are fearful of heights. Why? Perhaps because many primates in the past fell from trees and got injured. Chimpanzee skeletons in a while, when you, when you collect them, all have signs of broken bones and injured bones. Okay, so, so there's one. What else about fear? Well, fear, again, it's a trade-off. Fear is very good here. But fear can lead to paranoia. Fear can lead to high levels of anxiety. Fear can actually make you almost immobile because it's a trade-off. And that's at the extremes. It can be non-beneficial. So, so those are two examples that I think, or three examples, actually, that I think illustrate very well evolutionary medicine. And then, so what? So what does evolutionary medicine give to medicine? Evolutionary medicine provides a theory and models and hypotheses for why certain illnesses appear. Evolutionary medicine helps us to determine the difference between a highly evolved adaptive response that is good for us, like fever and iron sequestration, versus something that needs medical care, that needs immediate medical care. If your fever gets above 103 or 104, you need some kind of care for that. But a normal fever is less likely to need that. The other thing that evolutionary medicine provides for medicine is that it is an organizing principle, as I said earlier. Throughout biology, throughout physiology, it helps to organize theory in medicine. Medicine is now an evidence-based science. Those hypotheses are based on theory. Many of them are based on evolutionary theory. So I'd like to leave you with a final question. Why do we get sick? We get sick because evolution, via natural selection, has selected for fertility, for us to be able to have offspring and raise those offspring. Not for longevity, not for our bodies to last forever, but for the next generation to be born and to follow us. So why do we get sick? I hope I've helped you to understand that from a different point of view than just the things that happen to you, bacteria, injuries, cardiovascular disease because evolution doesn't see those. Natural selection doesn't see those things that are happening late in life. Thank you.